Thank you very much. My name is Dimitri Daskalakis. I'm the Deputy Commissioner for Disease Control at the New York State Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. I'm very excited uh, to be a part of this convening. Um, and today I will give a perspective from a large local health department uh, from the uh, on research needed to expand the use and effectiveness of PrEP. So this is gonna be a very urban view from New York City. I will start by saying I have nothing to disclose. So I'll start by just showing data that I think everyone is familiar with that there are unequal declines in HIV. So I'm focusing on New York City data as a local health department. And really, I think the lesson is that, um, that there is heterogeneous uh, declines in HIV um, and also some areas where we have a lot more work to do. So as you see, significant declines in men who have sex with men, but it is um, really uh, uh, graded by race as well as other factors. And you can see sort of the areas in transgender uh, individuals um, where we actually are not seeing declines. But that is also reflected in what we see in PrEP use. So the number of PrEP users, when you look by sex, race, and ethnicity, um, shows that whites are in the league, uh, despite the fact that they are not um, the uh, folks who are the most uh, impacted uh, by new HIV infections uh, in both our jurisdiction and also nationally. Uh, Blacks, Hispanic, Latinos, and Asians, uh, as well as women, are underrepresented among PrEP users. So. Um, in general, um, there's that Venn diagram that both access to PrEP and reductions in HIV are far lower among Black men who have sex with men, Latino men who have sex with men, cisgender women, especially if they're Black and Latina, and transgender gender people, especially if they're Black and Latina transgender women. So our key question, from my perspective, is how can we expand PrEP use and accelerate declines in HIV among Black, Latino, and Asian men who have sex with men, as well as cisgender women and transgender people? That is our core question. So so some very important research questions from our perspective, living in an urban environment um, with, uh, uh, with a mature HIV uh, epidemic. So what would make PrEP easier and more attractive? And specifically, what would do that for Black people, Latinas and Latinos, and cisgender and transgender women? How do we address racial bias in PrEP prescribing and also PrEP interest? Are there cost barriers to PrEP or perception of barriers to PrEP? And is there a stigma that is different among different groups among using PrEP? How do we increase medical providers' comfort with discussing and prescribing PrEP outside of practices that focus on the health of MSM? And how do you reduce PrEP discontinuation among people at continued risk of HIV? And then also one of our uh, core uh, strategies in New York City is how do you better develop and evaluate status neutral services that focus both on HIV care as well as prevention and delivery models to address the stigma that exists around both prevention and treatment of this infection? So how to reduce stigma around using PrEP? So there are several strategies that have, uh, have been uh, discussed, included are normalizing and universalizing PrEP education and services, centering patient experiences during counseling, and acknowledge the interconnectedness of stigma and structural barriers to care to address disparities in access. So really areas that require more fleshing out and more questions from the perspective of PrEP. Also, we need to focus research on going beyond oral PrEP. So we know that oral PrEP is at a high bar for preventive, uh, preventive effectiveness. So it's important to better understand how to maintain adequate adherence and persistence over time, uh, which continues to be one of the greatest challenges of PrEP implementation. So what might help? New dosing, so PrEP on demand. We have to evaluate all formulations to learn more and consider evaluating it in more populations. Uh, new daily oral options. So is there, uh, uh, are there strategies that can make PrEP more appealing, uh, for instance, <coughs> for individuals who are concerned <coughs> about re real or perceived side effects of so the potential of using tenofovir uh, TAF-based regimens like Descovy, and also um, really critical work in longer acting PrEP formulations. So I think many of these options will help address some, but not all barriers experienced with once daily oral PrEP. And um, also it becomes a core research question of how to implement both current strategies and new strategies more effectively and equitably. So there are also, a, there's an, a need I think highlighted by COVID uh, to show how we can demedicalize PrEP strategies. So we know PrEP is the gateway to primary care. Uh, but is high medical engagement what everyone who uses PrEP wants? That's an important question. So I think work in, in identifying the utility and benefits of initiating same-day PrEP starts without waiting for a lot of lab work, as well as making the PrEP package more compact while preserving safety and efficacy. So my questions are, what is the minimum lab package, including STI testing, required to uh, start and maintain PrEP? 
what is the minimum care package? Do you have to be seen every uh, once every three months? Uh, I, I mean that both from the perspective of content and frequency. How can we make PrEP more self-serve? I think that's critical, especially when we've seen uh, the impact of, uh, of COVID on healthcare. This is our chance to potentially use those ideas and evaluate further how PrEP can be made uh, more of a self-service option. And can we really... Uh, shoot toward making prescriptions uh, extended to 12 months and coupled to home tests? Can we give more of the prep power uh, to people rather than uh, have it be uh, 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 exclusively within a healthcare setting? Now, this slide is just to show that there are a lot of technologies that are coming to uh, um, through research and hopefully eventually to market um, that may make PrEP a more diverse strategy as well as something uh, more appealing to other folks. So whether it is uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies or injectables or implantables, uh, a lot of work has gone on and needs to continue in the research space around new technology. I won't go deeply into that because that is an, uh, 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 that does not need to be emphasized per se, since it is a core piece of, of PrEP research. So choices are critical. So beyond injectables, again, there are long-acting uh, injectable nanoformulations, implantable devices, microneedle patches, broadly ne neutralizing monoclonal antibodies, and agents typically administered by gel, ring, film, or fiber. So really, a lot of areas that require more basic science and clinical in, uh, science research, but then also critical need for implementation science to see which of these and how these may be implemented in the real world. So that means developing models and measures to better understand and understand PrEP initiation, uh, identify patients' uh, thought process behind choice of prevention strategy, switching strategies potentially, as well as discontinuation. We have to better explore provider behavior around PrEP and assess interventions that we can use to change behavior to increase prescribing, especially of different modalities. And also, I understand effective drivers of PrEP decision-making to inform patient-centered communications and protect against the implicit bias that often comes in provider recommendations of PrEP use and will likely come in recommendations for different modalities of PrEP use. Several questions. Will long-acting PrEP increase use? Will it be more appealing for certain people or populations? How do people and providers want long-acting PrEP to be implemented? A very important question. And can long-acting PrEP be used for rapid induction and then followed by oral PrEP for maintenance? So will oral PrEP users switch from pills to long acting? So I think that that's a question that, we, that needs to be pursued. I'm not gonna read this slide, but ultimately it looks as if uh, uh, individuals uh, who are middle income um, compared to high income are more likely to switch. People who uh, actually had a psychological component to taking pills were more likely to switch to a long acting agent. And um, you know, I think also just generally a lot of qualitative areas that are really critical in understanding how to roll out different uh, formulations and different strategies in a way that is uh, responsive to community. Um, so some several re uh, implementation questions around long acting PrEP include, can HIV breakthrough after a recent injection or implant of PrEP happen? How often and why? Will the option to implant PrEP or receive an injection every month or two attract new people to using PrEP? So will it do uh, increase the options and is that good enough to increase PrEP uptake? How do we reduce medical mistrust as a barrier to PrEP, particularly to clinically intensive and physically invasive modalities? In other words, um, from the perspective of our main barrier, how do we make medicine less racist? Um, what clinical supports will be needed to make people comfortable with an implant or injection and to keep them engaged for follow-up injections or implants? What is the ideal package and what is the minimal package? How can we even make more medical strategies feel less medical to people who may not want to engage to the same depth? There are lessons from contraception. We know that PrEP use will be imperfect, so we have to develop strategies to support use. Continuation rates with injectable are not much higher with other contraceptives, and new technologies will not increase choice if health services to support them uh, don't exist or provide quality care. So it's really a part of that holistic strategy uh, to figure out how to create the perfect package as well as the minimum package. So failure to account for user preference and social context can undermine potential benefits, and a narrow focus on the technology alone is unlikely to solve health and social challenges associated with HIV prevention. So there needs to be a focus on the implementation of the science as well. So if long-acting PrEP lacks a programmatic home for introduction, do we need to find one to be able to expand it? Um, and, and really, the lesson here again is that implementation science is key as we roll out new technologies. Um, in terms of specific populations, 
looking at cisgender women, several research questions. Will long-acting PrEP increase women's access to and interest in PrEP? Are newer PrEP formulations, including TAP, FTC, safe and effective for cisgender women? A question that we still don't know. Is taking PrEP on demand safe for women? Is it effective during receptive vaginal sex? How to address barriers of PrEP is not for me. How do, how do we make discussions of sexual health revolve less about around risk, more around pleasure, and the control that is, provi that is provided by taking pre-exposure prophylaxis? Will women accept an implantable device or an insertable device? How can we better combine PrEP with services that women need? And can contraceptive and PrEP technologies be combined in a way that, are, that is acceptable to women? Moving on to transgender people. Will periodic PrEP injections prove particularly attractive to trans folks who are periodically injecting hormones? Um, why lesser continuity on PrEP happens among transgender persons? We still need to learn more. So what clinical supports are needed to reduce high PrEP discontinuation rate among that community, especially Black and Latina trans women? How to better integrate PrEP, gender affirming care, and services for housing and food stability, really identifying uh, sort of the more holistic needs to create a package um, that for some trans people may provide uh, better support to maintain PrEP um, by really addressing their, uh, their hierarchy of needs. Do gender affirming hormones slow achievement and protective levels of PrEP in tissue when PrEP is taken on demand? That's a really important question. Um, PrEP and adolescence, so more research questions in that space as well. Can updated and comprehensive sexual education increase awareness and use of PrEP? Can that reduce stigma? How to support adolescent adherence? How, um, how can we better support adolescents' adherence to and persistence on PrEP? How can we increase youth access to sex positive and LGBTQ affirming care? And how can we actually measure the effect of policy that allows for adolescents to receive PrEP and other sexual health care without parental consent? And again, my favorite question, what is the ideal package? And then what is the minimal package for adolescents to both optimize safety, adherence, and efficacy? Thank you very much.